podcast. Good evening, Charlie. Good evening, Matthew. Great to talk to you. So essentially, the only team you weren't promoted with was Hull City. Well, I left Derby to come to a big city, and to be fair, I had a lot of hopes of obviously all achieving certain things, but I must admit, as soon as I got there, I realised it wasn't the club I thought it could be. And it wasn't down to the management, it was down to the chairman at the time. Hmm. Uh, Don Robinson? Yes. OK. Do you want to expand on that? Well, I felt we had some promising young players there, and I just felt we just needed to spend a bit more money on bringing some better class of players and improving the wages. And to be fair, when I came there, I realised the wage structure was very tight, and mm. that's what was stopping the better players from actually coming to the club. And the so-called good young players would eventually have to leave the club. And that's what eventually happened to Hull. Yeah, in, I mean, in a way, that, that is both a credit to Hull City and something to its detriment, isn't it? That the players, a lot of good players in that mid-1980s period went on to great success but had to leave Hull City in order to, to get it. But it was a, um, a young and, and highly rated side that you joined, February 1987 when you came. Were you, before that, were you seen by Derby, you'd just been promoted to the top flight, were you seen by Derby as somebody who could cope in the second tier and that's why they let you go once you got promoted to the top flight? Well, we got promoted and obviously I wanted to stop at Derby. I got offered a new contract. However, it was stated in the contract that I would have to fight for my place. Now, I just felt being part of a side was just one promotion. I wanted a a fair crack at playing in that level. However, I could sense by the players are bringing in and obviously what the manager was saying to me that I would have to buy my time. So I had a very good offer from Brian Norton through mm-hmm. Eric Still because Eric Still and Brian Norton played together at Brighton and I thought to myself, it's a big city, come on, let's have a go, let's see what it's like up there. Mm. And to be fair, when I first went up there, when I was travelling, I really enjoyed it. But, as I said, as soon as I found out what the club was about, I was a bit disappointed because I feel it's a big city and it should be achieving a lot more than what it has done in the past. Well, maybe it's taken 20 years more than, than, than envisaged at the time, but it, it's on the verge of, of achieving everything that you were, you're were you talking about now, of course, and we'll, we'll come to the comparison of, of that shortly. You were Watford as a lad. You came through the ranks at Watford, and, and Brian Horton was Luton yes. as a player in his later career. So he would have known... I mean, he brought Richard Jobson from, uh, from, from Watford as well, and he got Frankie Bunn and Gary Parker from Luton. So he would have known... He knew all about the Watford youngsters and uh, from his time up the road in Bedfordshire, because that rivalry existed then. Of course, it still exists now, even though there's, there's going to be next season two divisions difference between them. So... Um, one would one guesses that he, he saw plenty of you in your time as a as a youngster at Watford to be able to go to Derby and make that move. When you look at Watford and you look at Luton as football clubs, they have to depend on their youth setup. And to be fair, we used to have a lot of local derbies, obviously games playing in a football combination against Luton. And to be fair, people like Brian would always come along and watch the young ones play. And Eric Steele, who actually was very, very close to, said to me, one day Brian Orton will be a very good manager. The way he's actually building his career, he's going to go and obviously manage a club. And I just said to myself, obviously, I know what I have to do as a youngster. With every opportunity I get, no matter reserve, youth team, is to try and perform at the best of my ability. And eventually one day someone will take a chance on me. But when I played for Watford, I fully enjoyed it. And the same thing happened. I played 16-odd games in the old first division. But obviously... They brought in a new fullback, and I felt I've been playing five years, reserve team football, youth team football, I need to be playing in somebody's first team. So that's when I took the opportunity of going to Derby. Mm. Uh, and obviously Eric Still, who very close with um, Brian Orton, actually joined the same summer. I think that was 1984. And obviously me and Eric had a, obviously lived in digs together. And we just built a very strong relationship and then when I was having a bit of a, not bad time, but when I realised it's time for me to leave, obviously, Derby, that's when, obviously, knowing Brian and, obviously, Brian taking a chance on me, I thought, I'm going to jump at it. At this end, it was a nice sort of um, symmetry between you needing the move and knowing Brian Horton and Brian Horton yeah. needing a right back because Richard Jobson had been playing there, but it was obvious that his place was in the centre of defence and Brian Horton had made it clear that he was going after a right back at some point... Um, during the season, the manager wanted wanted Richard Jobson in the middle, and so he went on the hunt, and uh, in you came. I, to be fair, it was a great opportunity because, like, if anybody knows, Derby is a football in town, and I felt I was leaving Derby to go to Old City, which is a big, big city, and I thought, come on, if we can turn it round there, mm. we can get the support behind us, and we can take the club to places. And to be fair, whilst I was travelling up and down the motor, it was tiring, but I was really enjoying the football. 
But sorry to say, at the same time, I must admit, when I actually played, it was more of a rugby town. And obviously things have changed since then. But the success it's getting now, and hopefully mm. they sit out to the end, it deserves Premiership football because it's such a big city and there's, I'm sure the supporters are craving for a bit of success. Oh, absolutely, and we're on the verge of it, of course. I've always, my, my belief for what it's worth has always been that there's room for three, all three clubs to be successful and regarded as um, um, part of uh, the town's heritage and, and to epitomise uh, the city. It's not necessarily going to be a football city um, or a rugby league city. There's always... There's always room for all three. Let's go back to this um, mild criticism you've got of the club's ambition at the time you joined. I mean, like I say, you had people like Frankie Bunning and Gary Parker, Alex Dyer had joined. These guys had, had, had come down to, to, to come down a level in many ways to join Hull City and then went up a level when they left. I mean, did they all have, do you think, I mean, of those guys, the only ones I've spoken to um, on this programme is, that I can think of off, off, off the top of my head, of, of Brian Horton's sort of young signings, is Richard Jobson. He, he didn't make any particular mention of that. But do you think that they all held... Pretty much the same opinion, and did it affect team spirit that that there was that there was perhaps this problem with the the ambition of the club at the time? No, to be fair, you had Brian Orton, you had Dennis Boven, what they'd done, and they knew what players to bring in because they knew the characters and they knew young players would be hungry. They brought in an influx of good young players, but who was hungry to actually succeed, and they, they built a team spirit knowing that whatever was up against us. And to be fair, I'm, I shouldn't be saying this. Obviously, Don Robinson had a wage structure, which, in hmm. my eyes, he should have improved it, as I've said. But obviously, the players knew they deserved a lot more. But we were all convinced, let's do it through performances, let's win games, let's push this club as far as we can. And hopefully, people might start changing their views on what players hmm. should be paid. Now, when it got to the stage where that wasn't going to happen, that's when the better players had to start moving on. And that's Jobbo moved on. Obviously, um, Gary Parker moved on. And um, Frankie Bunn moved on. And obviously, I just felt at the time if people pumped a bit more money into the club or pumped a bit more money onto the playing side, I felt there was an opportunity for us to actually achieve something. Let's talk about the actual football when you arrived. It was a big shuffle of the defence when you arrived. Jobson, as I said, moved from the right-hand side of the defence into the centre. Pat Hurd moved from the centre to the left. You came into the right-hand side. Only Peter Skipper didn't have to switch positions, and you wouldn't have asked Skip to play anywhere else other than centre-back. So you had, initially, a, a back four that, that stuck for a while, actually, of, of Palmer, Skipper, Jobson and Hurd. It was a back four that would, would serve City well for the next 18 months or so. I felt like everybody knows what Peter Skip is like, you give him a job, he's gone, Ed things, he wins his tackles and all that, but knowing Richard from obviously Watford days, I knew how good, he's, good he was and that's one of the reasons why I decided to go up to all. But I felt with myself, if Jobber was going to go and play centre-half, I could obviously use my of the fitness and um, my aggression up and down and obviously get the supporters on my side. And to be fair, I felt when I had the opportunity, I'd done that very well. But like I say... At the end of the day, I just felt we just needed, and I shouldn't say it, we needed some more players to add to that squad. Mm. Well, I mean, I think there was a, a re for, for what Hull City had, it was a reasonably sized squad. But yeah, you're right. I mean, there's always there's, you always think there's um, there's a possibility of Im improvement in in various areas of the park, and, and the, the club's record under Brian Horton after that first season, the one before you joined, where they very nearly got promotion, yes, uh, which was the best season that City have had up until this season. Um, certainly, there was there was there was an element of disappointment that the, the, the squad couldn't keep it going for the next two years. That first half season, because you arrived, as I say, in February, it, the season really hadn't really got going and didn't get going. Did it feel like everyone was waiting for the following season when you arrived and they were just sort of playing the games out and just waiting for the summer and pre-season and, and the chance to start all over again? If, if I'm right, we were on the verge of a fighting relegation and mm. we had to beat Crystal Palace at home. Am um, I right? Um, I'm not sh on the verge of fighting relegation, I think is slightly strong. Um, quite, certainly finished, but... certainly finished mid-table after yeah. uh, the, those two full seasons that you had were both pretty much the same. Where you, I'm just um, looking at the the Hull City record book I've got here, and um, <laughs> finished 14th in uh, in what was then known as Division Two. Now, of course, the Championship actually only did finish five points clear of um, of the bottom three. So you may have a point. There was certainly yeah. a, there was certainly a bad run in the second half of the season. So um, yes, go on. You, you carry on. Tell your story. We we um, actually played Crystal Palace and we beat. Crystal Palace and that, the Ian Wrights and Mark Bryant, the Andy Gray. And to be fair, I felt that was a turning point because all of a sudden, because we beat such a good team, everybody, all the young lads felt, yes, next season we've got half a chance. But like, we went away in the summer thinking that we had two or three players to the squad, obviously we'll do well. However, we've got a good start and like, Brian Orton's very good, he motivates you, he had this knack of 
trying to say the world's against you, we can do it within the camp, this and that. And to be fair, he got the best out of those young players. Mm. And obviously, for myself, Brian done me a lot of favours by realising what I was actually going through with my family condition position, but obviously kept on playing me and obviously using that opportunity to still enjoy my football. But obviously, away from the game, I was having a bit of a rough time. But at the end of the day, I really did enjoy while Brian Orton was there. And sadly to say... When he actually got sacked, I felt guilty because I knew, obviously, he brought me into the club. I'd done a good job part. Well, I would say I'd done a mm. fairly good job, but I just felt if I actually achieved what I know I could have achieved, he might have kept his job. But then that's my being a bit harsh on myself. I just felt there was times when Brian needed some funds to actually bring some players in and we might have been able to push on. Well, I'd like to make a confession as well. I was slightly harsh on you. Three wins out of the last four in that season in order to get that, those five points clear of the relegation zone. So, yes, it was a, an authentic relegation battle. I must confess, my first season of actually watching City was actually the following year, which was your first full season. Mm. Um, I started in the, the summer of 87 and you joined in the February. So I missed the, that, that uh, second half of the of the season. There was a cup run that year, though. Fifth round, you were eligible for. You didn't play in the cup for Derby that season. So you, you came in for the fifth round tie, which was at Wigan, and a big chance to play Leeds in the quarter final. And it went very badly wrong, didn't it? It was, the, it was a really disappointing uh, outcome in the end. I can't remember too much of the game, but I knew, like, obviously, that was one of the main points why I decided to come because I thought they're still in the cup. Obviously, if we can have a good cup run, it's going to be TV coverage. People are going to know about me, this and that. But I remember it was a bad, bad result and a bad performance and mm. as youngsters, because I would say we're all young, we let ourselves down in the day. But to be fair, those things actually happen. And as long as, long as, as players, as individuals, you learn from it, it makes you a better player. 3-0 mm. defeat and, yeah. um, Wig um, against Wigan, who were a couple of divisions below at the time, and then Leeds beat them in the quarterfinals and uh, went on to lose um, in uh, the semi-finals. So at least um, all avoided a, didn't, didn't get the, the tie against Leeds that Hull City wanted. Yeah. At least Leeds didn't go all the way to the final, which would have been uh, made it even worse. On Thursday, Chairman's Night, Paul Duffin talking to uh, head physio Simon Maltby and uh, fitness coordinator Sean Rush. On Friday, for the second time this week, we're going to have a plethora of squeaky bums on the second Hull City fans panel who will review the season as as well as uh, look ahead to the... Uh, it's kind of a do-or-die, really, or, or certainly, well, sort of a do-or-die game against Ipswich. Promotion could be sealed, or we might have to wait uh, another sort of two or three weeks uh, for the uh, for the playoffs to uh, pan out. But uh, anyway, they'll be looking ahead to the Ipswich game on Sunday, which, of course, will be on KCFM as well. Hull City Live is from 11 o'clock on uh, Sunday. Kickoffs at Portman Road from 2, and then over to Cardiff after the game, about three-quarters of an hour after the game, hopefully during which time Ian Ashby will be leading the team on a lap of honour and celebrating Premier League football. Um, when we go over to Cardiff for Super League Live, FC versus KR, Millennium Magic kicking off at half past four. Just to let you know also as well, one of um, Charlie's most distinguished predecessor, I would say, is right back, the current Hull City right back, and uh, Welsh international Sam Ricketts will be the guest at Southbank Tigers, um, who are hosting the event tomorrow night at Barton Town Old Boys FC Clubhouse. It's on Marsh Lane. If you're an official supporters club member, you get in for free. Non-members pay £2, and it starts at 730 tomorrow evening. Charlie Palmer's with us. Uh, keep calling, texting, emailing. We'll put some questions from you to him a little later on before uh, 8 o'clock. Um, Charlie, when you arrived at Hull City, Ray Daniel was already here, and Alex Dyer signed at uh, pretty much exactly the same time as you. Now, you three were the first black players at the club. Was anything pointed out to you about how the fans might react to this? This was, of course, the, the, the mid-1980s, after all. Not really, but as players, as individuals, you knew you would have to perform to the best of your ability. And obviously you can win the fans over. And to be fair, if you know the three of us, like, obviously, I gave 100%, Alex would give 100%, and Ray was in and out the side at the time. But, like, I just felt to win the supporters over, I'm going to actually show them that I'm an attacking fullback and I'm going to show them how good I was. And to be fair, football-wise, I didn't really have a problem with the racial side. Mm. It's obviously my wife, who is a Derby girl living in a big city away from home, she found it very hard. And obviously that's when the problem started to kick in the following season. But Brian was aware of it, Alex was aware of it, and um, Dennis Booth. And to be fair, they supported me. And as long as I was focusing all my energies on the game, I was actually enjoying my football. Racial issues and racial abuse, as and when they happened to guys of your generation, was just some, was something that I, I guess not just you, but, but all the uh, the black players of that era had to deal with quite a lot, but I expect. To be fair, 
I'm going to be honest with you now. I was used to, and obviously certain things were said about me colour when I was back at Watford, and I just felt, and I took it the way that people were going to say things to try and put you off your game and not to obviously rise to it. And I can remember one incident when I played for Derby and I lost my head down at Millwall, down at the Den, and I said to myself, no matter how much they're calling you, what name they're calling you, do not let them get to you because obviously you're bowing down to them. And to be fair, it was a bit of a learning curve. So when I came to all, there was problems there, but I didn't really take it to heart. The problems I had is my wife couldn't actually understand why she was treated differently hmm. when we went walking through the town. Because the town, it's a nice town, and obviously there was black people, but obviously it just looked like we were different human beings. And obviously I felt that was wrong. She felt it was wrong. And after nine months, ten months, she moved back to Derby. I'm not sure how great a reputation or otherwise the city generally had on, on racial issues at that time. But you, were, as far as the fans were concerned, as I the recall, people. you were certainly, certainly welcomed by the majority, weren't you? To be fair, the supporters were brilliant to me. I really enjoyed it when I started running down the touch lines and all that. I had their support taught them after games, I had no problems at all. But I was warned on a couple of occasions if I was out on a Saturday night to be aware. Mm. And to be fair, when you work hard during the week and you play your football on a Saturday afternoon and you get a good result, you like to unwind in your, in your town. And it, I found myself, after nine months, going back to Derby each weekend, which was wrong. I'm playing for Old City. I should be enjoying my social time with the players in Old City mm. and obviously going around the wine bars, but that wasn't the case. Did players of your generation, I'm not going to dwell on this subject too much, we'll only have another five minutes or so on it, but did, did players of your generation see yourselves as having the opportunity to, to beat racism? I mean, let's, let's face it, it, um, it was rife in football in the 70s and, and certainly for a good deal of the 80s. Did you have the opportunity, did you see yourself as having the opportunity to beat it by being good on the pitch and winning yes, the crowd over yes. by being a good footballer? Yes. To be fair, you know what he's going to come against, but being, like you're saying, a very good footballer, being good for your team and obviously showing them how good you are and you're there to actually help the team and be a positive role model. At the end of the day, that's one way. People might say, you're this, you're that. But if you're winning games and you're actually making it clear to them that you're not affecting my performance, all of a sudden they're going to get realised he's a very good pro. Hmm. He's put all that to one side and he's continued playing at a very high standard. And to be fair, we all got that message believe in yourself, they're only out there to try and put you off. Mm. And uh, to be fair, from the time your own supporters are not calling you, you know you're doing actually a very good job, which at all, I felt I'd done a good job. It could have been better, but I did enjoy my time. OK, and one last, one last point I'll make on this before we move on. I dare say that it was probably going to be harder for Ray Daniel than anyone else. He had to deal with it more than you and Alex Dyer, perhaps, because he was the very first black player. He'd been at the club six months when you and, and Alex arrived. And any problems that, there were, that existed with the crowd during that six-month per, six period were obviously going to be solely aimed at him. And the fact that he wasn't a regular player as well and therefore wasn't always earning his place in the side might have um, made it slightly more difficult. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, you've been on here, Matthew... When we actually came to the club, and I knew Ray from his Luton days, so I spoke to him, and he wasn't negative about it, but he informed us that he had some problems with it, and I had just had it in my head, I'm going to be positive now and show them how good I was, and obviously go out there and play to the best of my ability, like I've mm. said, and try and win the supporters over. And when you win the support, supporters over, all of a sudden they don't look at your race, they look at you as an old city player. Absolutely, yeah. And that's my philosophy, and... To be fair, Ray did help me a lot because obviously he sat me and Alex down and he spoke for a good half an hour about what he's encountered. And it was obviously a learning curve because I played with John Barnes and I saw what John Barnes went through. But when it actually happens to yourself hmm. and you're thinking, flame me now, how are you going to cope? Obviously, taking on board with other people and how they've experienced and what, how they've had to deal with it, you start saying to yourself, this is what I'm going to do when I get the opportunity to show them how good I am. Well, if anyone's won crowds over through footballing ability, it's John Barnes, isn't yes. he? Did it, he did it for, I mean, you remember that awful situation he had in the summer of 84 when he was on the South American tour with England and those fans who were on the plane with him all the way back, I, mean, I, I dread to think. And also, he, he had to win over the Liverpool crowd, certainly, yes. when he first moved there. I think he was Liverpool's first regular um, black player in their side. Let's move on from that. Um, you settled down. Now, by the 1987-88 season, it was all very positive. I'm glad you used the word positive in your last answer, because it's in my next question. You didn't miss a game in that season until February, and up until the new year, or certainly Christmas into the new year, it was looking really good. Well, to be fair, Brian 
we, like I've said it before, we we got very good result against Palace, and all the young players thought we've got a chance next season. And Brian, obviously, he's a great motivator. He knew team spirit was important because obviously the wages were earning. And to be fair, we all wanted to do well for each other, and we had a great run. And the Leeds game where we actually won, and obviously I was about to bring that up. Yeah, yeah go on. With the Leeds game which we won, and to be fair. I might get booed now. I'm a loose supporter myself, so I actually beating them on that day, I'm obviously. Gl- I'm glad I'm glad you're sitting in a studio in Derby <laughs> right now. That's all I can say. Carry on. Well, when we beat them, that was obviously a very big moment in my career to beat me, Charlie's team. But to be fair, after beating Leeds, you're thinking, you've got a chance, Charlie. You've got a chance of achieving something. And to be fair, things didn't actually happen. And well, that, that's an understatement. I'll go through it because um, I was going to ask you if you remember. Let's talk about that game specifically, the Leeds game. It was three-one. It was essentially the New Year home fixture. It was on the third. Yes. It was on the third of January after losing five-nil at Villa on New Year's yeah. Day. We'll, we'll, we'll forget about that. Fifteen thousand at Boothbury Park, a, 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 a ground that would hold no more than eighteen thousand at the time. So it was a, a heck of a turnout for a for a New Year game and for a league game, albeit obviously Leeds brought a lot. Um, and just, I mean, I was there. What a fantastic occasion! What an amazing game itself as well for the for the for the frantic sort of quality and the pace of the game, and a brilliant, brilliant result. I just felt in that game, if you looked at the Leeds team, and I remember Bobby Davidson playing up front, but if you looked at the Leeds team, we had it in our heads: don't respect them. Obviously, we're all there fighting for our places, hoping to obviously win this game, and we showed them no respect. We worked them from the first minute to the last minute, and I think they had a bit of a shock. And to be fair, as players, we knew was on top, and obviously we won the game, but we felt now we've beaten the mighty Leeds, we can actually move on again. And to be fair, it was a great night, great game, great occasion, and we all felt, all the young players felt, yes, we can go all the way here. But obviously, like I said, it didn't happen. Mm. We'll go through that team that started... Um that game, because of course we should remember as well that a certain Peter Swan scored the Leeds goal yeah. uh, that day about, uh, what, pff, probably six months to a year before he actually uh, joined the club himself. Uh, the team that day that beat Leeds was Tony Norman in goal. Uh, actually, before we go any further, what sort of presence, his presence behind you must have made you feel even more confident as a defender. Tony Norman, still, I think most little City fans would say, the greatest keeper the club's ever had. Tony Norman, by far the best keeper I've played with. A very underrated outside of Old City. I felt he could have achieved a lot more. And I felt uh, it was a privilege to play with such a keeper. OK, let's uh, go through that team uh, of the uh, who played against Leeds. Tony Norman in goal, Charlie Palmer, of course, number two. Pat Hurd at number three, Richard Jobson, Peter Skipper, Neil Williams, who was another one who Brian Horton brought yeah. from that sort Watford. of uh, Watford-Luton yes. uh, area. Gareth Roberts, of course, the skipper at seven. Andy Payton on his full debut. Andy scored after a couple of minutes of that game as well. A great day yeah. for him uh, at number eight. Alex Dyer. Billy Askew and Gordon Owen, who people might remember. He only played three games on loan for City, but one of them was the victory against Leeds. Uh, and one of the subs that came on was a certain uh, Gary Parker, who actually didn't yeah. start that game, but came on as a sub in the second half. But after beating Leeds, City didn't win again for 13 games. It was an awful run uh, that everybody who was associated with the club, whether you were in the well, in the, the best stand like me as a, as a 14-year-old, or whether you were a player, uh, manager, director, whatever you happened to be, um, nobody's going to forget how we felt as just that slide from such a promising position came down the table. How did you, as a group of players, cope with coming in for training each week after another defeat or another bore draw that you should have won? Because it must have been demoralising for that to happen week after week. It, it was hard, I ain't going to lie. It was very hard, but I just felt after winning such an important game against Leeds, we needed to bring players in. It didn't happen, and obviously we, re- we realised this is the squad of players was going to try and obviously get us up or obviously going to finish off the season. So when we started losing games, I ain't going to lie to you, the training mm. s- seemed long and boring, the rules against you, this and that, and I just felt we just needed some fresh faces. Well, some came in, of course. Peter Barnes arrived for a cameo, which, which yeah, be, I remember right. he, had a, he had a great debut and then couldn't kick a ball in the right yeah. direction for the rest of his time. Ken Demange came in, and, and two signings that really did work were Keith Edwards and Wayne Jacobs. And, yeah, and, and Wayne Jacobs, very good fullback, and to be fair, I felt Wayne should have played a lot higher probably early in his career because I knew about mm-hmm. him at Sheffield Wednesday because that's where he came from, Sheffield mm-hmm. Wednesday. Yes, I, I remember, thought, yeah. I thought he was a very good fullback. But like, but like I said, like it was tough. And to be fair, when players start losing games, players are not honest. They start blaming each other and they're looking at their own performances and the weak characters. All of a sudden, 
start appearing and it was sad really because from having a great start, having a good bunch of players, good team spirit, obviously the weaker players, if I should say that, the weaker players are starting to look for other people mm. to make a scapegoat when we should have all rallied together and tried to pull ourselves out of the mess we were in. I mean, two key players were sold. Frankie Bernard left bef- before Christmas actually and mm. uh, gone to, to Oldham, but Gary Parker was sold on deadline oh. day to Forest, which was a, a great move for him and you couldn't really argue with the sentiment behind the move, but even Brian Horton, of course, is now back at the club, now has been on this programme as, as the current assistant manager, talking about his time as manager and saying he probably shouldn't have done that. Gary Parker, let's be honest now, I came, trained, the first training session, and Gary Parker was on the trainings, and I thought, God almighty, how come they've got a player like him playing for Old City? Because for me, he should have been playing a lot higher. Well, he did he in had the end, nat- didn't he? He's got, he had natural ability, he was full of confidence, he had good character, and I thought, hold on a minute, he knows he shouldn't be playing at this level, and to be fair, I just felt... It was a blessing in disguise that we did have him. It was, it was one of those situations where, I mean, he played in the FA Cup semi-final for Luton when they lost yeah. to Everton in 85, but, but he was challenging Ricky Hill. And in the end, because it was his old captain, Brian Horton, I think he, he decided, I'll, I'll have a couple of years down the division to see whether I can you know, remake a, a name for myself in order to, to get my move back up. I think he's admitted that in interviews himself, and of course it worked for him. He went to Forest, ended up in a couple of England squads, even though he didn't actually win a cap and won loads of of uh, trophies with Forrest and later with Villa and Leicester as well. You got injured in the February during that run. Nicky Brown replaced you for three games, and then you came back for four and then were out again. Um, Brian Horton did put you straight back in. But then there was that infamous 4-1 home defeat to Swindon. You missed the game. You didn't play again that season, in fact. But presumably you were around the ground that night when the decision came through that Brian Horton had been sacked after the game. Yeah, well, I didn't play, but obviously... Brian came in and told the players, and I felt guilty because obviously I felt I was one of his major signings at the time. Not the time, but I felt I was one of his major sign. Yeah, one of his top signings. Hmm. And I just did you feel as as one of the the, the, the top signings, the higher profile signings, yeah. that, that that it was up to the, the guys like you who'd been Thank those high profile much. signings to, to to keep him in work in a way. Yes, but and Brian knows obviously you don't mean to play badly on purpose, but I went through a bad period. And to be fair, I say, yeah, I should have been out the side, but there's certain things were happening off the field which obviously affected my performance. But there's no way, in my eyes, Brian should have got sacked because you've got to recognise he pulled a lot of young players together. He made a very good team. And like I say, the only thing he needed at that time was a bit of support from the chairman to bring in, obviously, some players who'd help the young lads. Hmm. And that wasn't the case. And when we heard that, he got sacked. I thought, oh, done. Yeah. What did you th- what did you think of the, the the senior players like Gareth Roberts and Peter Skipper immediately trying and indeed in a way succeeding in changing the chairman's mind? Because Don Robinson famously said to Brian Horton the same night, sorry, I've made a mistake, would you come back? And of course, the principals then took over and Brian Horton said no. But the fact is that there was some real player power going on because Gareth Roberts and Peter Skipper were at the forefront of this immediate campaign, still covered in mud from the game, to get, make sure Brian Horton wasn't relieved of his duties after all. They're both two experienced players and obviously everybody actually respected them within the camp and when they actually turned round and obviously had their discussion with Don, we felt Brian would come back. But at the same time, Brian knew what the chairman was about and knew certain things. Obviously, they've had discussions in the past and certain things didn't actually happen. So I felt Don made a decision which was too rash. He obviously should have thought about it, should have looked at what Brian's had to work with over the years and said to himself, he's done very well for this club. However, that wasn't the case, and obviously he sat Brian, which was mm. a wrong decision, and obviously Brian's moved on and he's done very well for himself. Of course. But, Thou- a thousand games as a manager, which yeah. proves his worth, doesn't it? Of course it does. Proves his pedigree, does. his heritage. Um, you played Manchester United, just before we leave this season behind, you played Manchester United in the League Cup um, that season, home and away, lost 5-0 at Old Trafford, which meant that the, there was only really sort of pride to play for in the return leg um, at, uh, at Boothbury Park. Do you remember much of that occasion? The only reason I ask is because if Hull City go up um, and play Manchester United in the league next season, it'll be the first time since that that uh, fixture that we've played Manchester United competitively. I'm going to be honest with you now. I'm, I remember the hammering. As it was that old <laughs> you, remember the defeat, you remember that the hammering's worse, uh, uh, yes. easier than, uh, than the, the, the narrow yeah, ones. Because yeah. obviously you look at your own performance and you try and analyse and think how could you have improved it and what have you learned from it and all that. So, to be fair, I do remember the hammering, but mm. I can't remember too much of the home okay. game. 
OK, um, just before we take another breather, 15th was where City eventually finished. I mean, it was the, the, the run-up to the new up to the Leeds game and including the Leeds, Leeds game that ultimately um, saved um, Hull City from, from a further drop. There was a good 11 points clear of, uh, of the drop zone, so it wasn't too serious in terms of the league position. But how disappointing was it after such a good run up to Christmas and New Year and, and such belief among the squad? How disappointing was it to, to, to end in the way that you did? Well... With myself, I've, I've, I've obviously came from Derby and won promotion, and I ain't going to lie to you. When he was doing really well, I thought, we've got a chance here, we've got a chance. So when the bubble burst and I thought, hold on, I'm out the side, things are not going right, this and that, and I just felt, no. With a bit more ambition, obviously, with a bit more know-how, we might have achieved something as a group of players, but it was sad, and sorry to say, when you're going through a period like we went through, you don't enjoy your training, you don't enjoy your games, and it's a battle. And all of a sudden, like I said, the weaker players, weak mentality, will start thinking we're defeated before we even go, go on the pitch. And I think that's what was happening. Charlie Palmer with us until 8 o'clock this evening. You ca- in came Eddie Gray after that uh, 88 season, Charlie. And, and again, you, you started well, you were in until Christmas, and then you got injured, unfortunately. And, and that was kind of the beginning of the end, wasn't it? Well, Eddie Gray, obviously, I've said it before, I'm a Leeds support and when Eddie Gray came into the club I thought obviously it was a privilege for me to obviously be coached by such a man who he was a very good coach he was very mild very quiet but obviously he had his ways and he relied on lads being fit and obviously playing a lot of five-a-side games but the sad thing about him people don't probably realize when I did wear the shirt I always gave 100 percent but Eddie Gray knew early on in the season that I wanted to leave and that was down to personal reasons. So mm-hmm. obviously after when I got me inju- injured, I knew my days were numbered and obviously that's when certain things had to happen and obviously I got me move. You, you were a right back and of course he was a left winger and I know that from all the stories of the other guys who played under Eddie Gray tell that he was still the best player in the, in oh. the club in training and, and the fact that you would have, if you'd ever played against him, then you would have marked him of course, it would have been a natural thing for you to mark him. I dare say he would have been, even at that time, would have been quite difficult to mark. I was amazed because when we came up for pre-season we'd done some fitness work and I mean so, some long distance, some long miles at well, and he was so fit, he kept at the front. And to be fair, I was embarrassed that he, on long distance he was a lot fitter than some of the lads. And I'm one of them. But when he came to his coaching, obviously he loved the fiver side, he loved the keep ball. And like you say, you couldn't get the ball off him. Mm. And you could tell what a good player he was. And, and to be fair, certain things he'd done with the ball, I would have been frustrated if I could do that with the ball, that my players couldn't do it. But he did not want to show frustrations on the players. And mm. I just felt... He was a great coach, however, I question whether he was a manager. Can I? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, 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 something that a lot of people uh, who were there at the time have also said. Um, can I, another nice bit of symmetry, given that you've um, admitted bravely um, that you're a, a childhood Leeds United fan. Your one and only goal for Hull City came yeah. uh, against Leeds at Leeds yeah. that season. I, I know we, we lost 2 on it, but I wasn't at the game. Please tell me you celebrated. I did celebrate. Good. To be fair, even... Though we lost 2 1, I was on cuckoo land because obviously I scored <laughs> against Leeds at Ellen Road. So obviously I've gone home thinking, yeah, we've lost, but I've scored my goal. And to be fair, I will always remember that day because it meant a lot to me. You're on a long list of one goal players for Hull City. There's a lot of them uh, down the years. And your, your successor, who, as I said on the air, is probably the best we've had since you, Sam Ricketts. He's, in, yeah. he's, about, he's, he's done two full seasons and only one goal so far. Your last game, actually, um, before you got injured, was against Ipswich which, on the New Year's Eve 1988, which people also remember as Billy Whitehurst's big return to the club. That was a, a heck of an event, wasn't it? It's- I came to all, and to be fair, even when Billy wasn't at the club, he was a legend. Everybody used mm. to talk about Billy, so when he actually came back to the club, I didn't realise what a legend he was till he came to that training room. And to be fair, everybody welcomed him back in open arms, mm. but he was a monster. <laughs> Monster I mean, on so, a I, Saturday and monster in training. I bet he was a monster in training. All right, yeah. uh, let's um, let's let's look ahead to to what happened when you because you did actually go around the time that the city was gripped with FA Cup fever against um, Liverpool. It was I know you left just slightly before the actual game. Nicky Brown had come in and, and deputised and stayed there all season and did um, an adequate job. I don't, don't think anybody thought he was a, a long term uh, replacement, but he came in and, and did fine. Um, 
Were you sad to leave? And were you sad to leave at a time when the club was playing, the team were playing pretty well and had got this FA Cup run and, and the best team in the country by some distance coming to play them? Well, to be fair, like I said, I had many problems off the park. Of course. It, it would have been nice, and I must admit, it would have been nice to see out the season and be involved in it. But obviously, I wasn't playing well. Nicky Brown came in and done a, a good job. Obviously, the club was going in a different direction than what I thought they could have done, you know what I mean? And I just felt it would have been nice, I must admit, it would have been nice to be involved, but I just thought I had to think about myself. Mm. And to be fair, I did miss the opportunity of playing against Liverpool, but football, you, you make decisions, you live by them, and you move on. We had a we had a plethora of um, poor to middling right backs after you left. I mean, the next one that, that springs to mind that that was worthy of the shirt, I think, was probably Mike Edwards, who was a teenager, in, and that was uh, nearly a decade later. Um, you came back the following season with Notts County. You went to Notts County. We, we you went with everybody's good wishes. And you came back the following season, opening day, and scored. Now I want to know why this happened because you. Um, Actually, no, it was the follow. I, I tell a lie. You had a full season away, and then you came back with Notts County 1990 mm. 91 season and scored on the opening day. You never managed to go at Boothbury Park in two and a half seasons, then you come back with Notts County and score after five minutes. Well, <laughs> it, it's, it's one of those, like, I came to all and had things to prove, and to be fair, I didn't think, or I didn't fulfill my potential that oh, I enjoyed some good games, but I felt with the period I was there, I could have done a lot better. And like I've said already, I felt. When Brian got the sack, me not performing didn't really help the matter. But I felt when I came back on that day, I had things to prove to those City supporters. And obviously, I've gone out there, we've won the game, I've scored. And it was nice to be able to go back and show him what a player I was. So, and to be fair, I've won promotion. So, I know mm. I, I'm a good at my job, but good at what I do. However, it's just, as I said, it was frustrating towards the end. And I just felt I needed to prove to all City, maybe prove to myself, I should have done better hmm. towards okay. the end at all. OK. Let's talk promotion. We've got about five, five and a half minutes to go. Let's talk promotion, because obviously it's a big weekend, a massive weekend for Hull City. Bigger than anything experienced during your time, which was the last truly successful yeah. time at this level for the club. We're talking about something similar to, to the early 70s side of Chilo and Waggy, which I'm sure you, uh, you know about. You're as well-placed as anyone. As I said, you had four in total in your career as a, as a first-team player. This weekend, Charlie, City have to win and Stoke have to lose. That's all that can happen. Anything else and City won't go up. They'll be in the playoffs. So in, in, how should they approach the game with automatic promotion this weekend still a possibility? Well, I'm sure Phil Brown knows his job and he's got a good group of players and the only thing he can focus on is that all City perform against it and get that result. Everybody knows football... Leicester are fighting for their life, Stoke mm. need a point, and anything can happen in football. But I'm telling you, Phil Brown and them old City players they ain't going to be thinking about what's happening over at Stoke. Unfortunately, they might not have a choice, of course, and you, you'll be able to tell us about this. You, you've had automatic promotion campaigns, and you'll know that suddenly a cheer has gone up from, from the yeah, crowd yeah, while yeah. you're playing, and that way you know immediately, even if you yeah. don't know the actual details, that the team that you want to lose are losing. Yeah, I fully agree with what you're saying. But and does, like, does that put you off at all? It, it, it can do, but I'm sure, obviously, Old City have got a, in a great position because there's a lot of belief a lot of Noah and a lot of players who obviously know this is their opportunity of achieving something, so they're not going to throw away that opportunity. They know come Saturday, on Saturday or Sunday? It's, Sunday. it's Sunday. It's on Sunday yes, afternoon, yeah. Sunday. They know they've got to do their job and hopefully things might work out in their favour. Mm. But they've had a good season. If Phil was honest with himself... He didn't believe they were going to be in this position. Now they've got in this position, they've got to grasp it and make sure they don't slip up. And the only thing they can rely on is them winning mm. and focusing on their game, and I'm sure they will win the game. Because there'll be more disappointment. Say Hull City win, yes. but Stoke also yeah. get their points. Um, that's that's fair enough. You've done all you can. But there'll be a, a lot of disappointment if Hull City don't win and Stoke lose, but Stoke still go up as a result. Phil will be saying to those players, don't come off at 20 to 5, quarter to 5, having regrets. Yeah. If you've known... You're in a great position. You're going to give it 100%. Show what you've been showing all season. Have the character. A bit of luck. You win your game. Let's see what happens across the road. I want you in that dressing room to, to give the team talk. I mean, Phil yeah. Brown's been... I want you there alongside him to, to give him the benefit of your experience of, of yeah. promotions. That's great. Um, 
And of course, as well as automatic promotion, you also won two playoffs with, with the king of the playoffs, Neil Warnock, who could well be involved with them again um, this season. What differences were there? Well, apart from the obvious difference of having to play, have to, have to start again, essentially, and play up to three games, what differences were there between the two ways of getting promotion? Did you have to change in any way once you knew we can't go up automatically, we're going to have to do it via the playoffs? Well, to be fair, as players, you're disappointed if you don't get automatic, but then all of a sudden, what Neil was very good at is getting the lads away from the area, getting their minds focused, that's gone, we move on, we've got a job to do, and this is how we're going to do it. His preparation for them key games were vital, and to be fair, he's a master at it. And to be fair, when you start, when you get one promotion and you've won it, you think to yourself, he's got the knack. Mm. And I just believe playoffs, there's a bit of luck. He's, he's lost one, of course, with Sheffield United, yeah. the one club he really wanted to take yeah. up by the playoffs. But he won with, with you at Notts County twice. He won with Huddersfield. Huddersfield. He won with Plymouth. And I yeah. think he won one more as well But that, that, that escapes me. And now, of course, he's got an opportunity, possibly, because uh, they still need a result this weekend, to be sure, of, uh, of doing it with, um, with Crystal Palace. What about the, the trips to Wembley themselves, um, Charlie, just briefly? Basically, well, what he'd done in the first playoff final, he took us down the weekend before to watch a final to experience being at Wembley and what it's going to be like and to be fair we sat down in that stadium and just watching the game I was nervous so obviously when I've come back the following week I've experienced it and I'm ready to go and obviously do my job and his preparation like I've said was very very good and he the only thing I'll say hopefully if you if Old City do not make it I know if they do make it like to see Old City and Palace in the final, mm. if that was the case. But okay. I'm hoping. I wouldn't, Sunday. frankly, because they're the one team. No, that, no, yeah, no, I, know, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. No, I'd, um, if Hull City gets to the playoffs, I think yeah. um, most people would like to play Watford, your first old club, because they're bad runner form leading into yes. the playoffs. But that's 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 for another that's for another day. Let's hope we don't have to worry about the playoffs and it can be sorted yeah. out on Sunday. Got about a minute to go, Charlie. So let's take one or two questions. In fact, I was going to say one or two questions. Um, I've got four text messages here from Rich, Nick, another Rich, and Sandy and Paul. All of them are in Hull. Uh, Rich is in West Hull. The rest are in East Hull. All asking the same question. Great to hear, Charlie. Is he still in football now? Now, the last job I knew you had was assistant manager at Hinkley United. You're not doing that anymore, but are you still in the game? Yes, I'm at a team called Quorn Town who play in Grizzly. Mm -hmm. uh, we played Gould the other day. And okay. We, and we beat him 6 2. So I'm still involved. What are you? You're manager, assistant? No, assist, assistant manager. Okay. Assistant manager. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm mean, still involved. And to be fair, I still look forward to my Saturdays. Good. And uh, are you working any, in anything other I'm else? I'm a qualified social worker, so I work with kids obviously mm -hmm. it can be challenging and obviously my football is opportunity for me to actually unwind well we hope to see you at the kc stadium sometime charlie and um thank you very much for coming on this evening some great memories it's been a pleasure and um we'll uh, we'll no doubt uh, have you on kcfm again uh, before long it's been a pleasure for me charlie i thoroughly enjoyed watching you as a, as a kid and i enjoyed talking tonight thanks for coming on wish the lads all the best and obviously i know nathan Dahl, who's playing in the reserves i know him very well he came on as a sub against crystal yes, palace and was outstanding so yeah, it's a very good player but obviously he's got some of their Wickets in front of him, who's a very good player and, himself. And anybody who knows, uh, if anybody's going to know about fullbacks, it's it's uh, it's Charlie Palmer. Charlie, we've run out of time, but thank okay. you very much. Take care, thank you very much. And that's Charlie Palmer, who uh, joins us tonight on Sports Call the 70s. Nights on the way.